Morning church, morning YouTube, as always, I say it every Sunday and I'll say it to the day I breathe my last. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be able to handle the word of God, to preach the word of God, to teach the word of God, and to share with those that God has put in my life. See, people understand that. Uh, you know, they think coming out on a Sunday many times is get in, get out as quick as you can. No, that's what I, what I do when I either go to get my oil change or if I go to the doctor, I want to get in and get out. I don't want to spend all day there. But when we come to hear the word of God and to learn the word of God, we want to spend time in this lab of word to reveal to what God has for us. Okay, last week we talked about a true believer or those that are deceived. A true believer is one that stakes their life, stakes their faith in Jesus Christ. They know him as their personal savior. Then we have many that were deceived by false teaching or religion that does not lead them to a surrendered life in Christ. The reason why so many people don't have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ or have the assurance of salvation is the fact that many places of worship, churches, do not lead, teach, preach, or show them what they need to be in Jesus Christ. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the truth of what the true church is and what a true church is not, which would make it a false church. Listen to this. Evidently, the church which teaches the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, is the true visible church. You're going to hear that throughout my message because I love it. Okay, first, first scripture I'm going to read to you is John 1, 13 to 14. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, and the glory of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They were not born, we cannot be born of our blood, meaning our family blood. We cannot inherit the, the kingdom of God by someone that gives it to us. Oh, here's your inheritance. You know, inheritance we know is usually it's, it's money or it's a car or something special that has significance. But a lot of people don't understand that. But we only are given this through the opportunity through Christ to become God's children. But the true church, do not use the word of God out of context. This is so important to understand that. They shall never take the word of God by twisting it and into something wicked in the sight of God. The word became flesh. Who was Jesus Christ? He was the complete image of God Almighty. What Jesus did in the way of his love and his grace and whatever he says was the truth. Okay? You get a lot of false teachers, prophets, so on and so forth. They tell you everything but the truth. It's important. Anyway, but next week we'll dive a little deeper in, and I want to do this, into how one must abide in the word of God. And if man does not, then he does not know the Lord. Without the word of God being the truth, and, I, and this is so significant, without the word of God being the truth, without Christ, Jesus Christ being the only truth, we would live in a world of deceit and lies, which we do anyway, but not when we know what the truth truly represents. Man cannot live and obtain salvation on lies, but only the true word of God in Jesus Christ. Okay, now let's talk about the church and how the church all came about. People think it all came about this way, so on and so forth. To me, it's important, but I want to really focus on what a true church currently is and what it was back then some 2,000 years ago. Some 60 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel was hit in many areas. Now remember, they didn't have planes, helicopters, cars, boats. They had boats, but not with motors on. So they had to get around by via, you know, foot traffic, camel, horse, whatever it may have been. The message of the gospel was hitting both the Greek and the Jew and the Gentile, which covers everyone. Either you're a Gentile or you're a Jew, okay? Everyone in the world is either a Jew or a Gentile. So anyway, they would gather in small gatherings, which was the true churches 
of Jesus Christ. Why did they gather? Because they wanted to learn more and God appointed apostles, teachers, preachers to handle the word of God, to come forth and say, this is what you need to do. This is how you understand. And they would pray and they would fellowship and they would love upon each other and they would grow. In the New Testament, the word church in Greek was ecclesia, which refers, listen to this, which refers to a group or assembly, a word used many times for secular gatherings. Uh-oh, secular gatherings. Listen to this. Acts 19, 39. But if ye inquire any of these things concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. Okay? Not a church. Not a true church, but a gathering. So believe it or not, you're going to love this. Some over 2,000 years ago, when people didn't get what they wanted, when the crowd was not happy, they would riot. They would protest. They would start trouble. So to prevent this from happening, they would do a lawful assembly to kind of air their grievances. So they wouldn't be a riot. But it's funny. I, I look at this and it seems like every time something do right now, currently, every time something don't go someone's way, their way, what do they do? They make a state, they protest, and so on and so forth. Because they're not happy. They want the world to know that they're not happy. Some things will never change. Anyway, the government set up legal assemblies to avoid riots and hear people in a form of a church. But of course, this would not represent the true church. Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 9. I just threw this in there. I like to use the word of God, all the new, to put it all together to support everything. Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 9 reads, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor chose you because you were more in number than any people for you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers as the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman and out of the house of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. Now therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth his covenant and mercy and them that love him, listen to this, with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Okay, so the people of God would have been a perfect example, let's go back to Deuteronomy, of a perfect definition of a true church. People that had faith in God, were obedient to his commandments, and loved him above all. See the significance. Praise God, we've been given Jesus Christ. Okay. Most important question for all mankind, meaning you. Mankind, you know, is women and men, all the world, everyone, no one excluded. Are you one of his people? It's a question that we have to ask. Worldly definition. I want you to listen to the worldly definition. I do this for a purpose. The worldly definition of a church. Listen to this. A church building, wrong. And, or a church house is a building used for Christian worship services and other Christian religious activities. The earliest identified Christian church, the House of Church, founded between 233 and 256. Now it gets better. I love this. I can't make this stuff up. A coherent group of individuals and families that join together to accomplish the religious purposes of mutually held beliefs. In other words, according to the tax court, the church principal mean is to accomplish its religious obligations. Now you'll wonder why there's so many false churches out there. I just read you man's definition of what a church is. I, I could just spend five weeks on just preaching that two sentences, but we won't. Second Timothy. First, 1, 9, 9, 9 to 14. 2 Timothy 1, 9 to 14. You all have this. Okay. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. This is, I want you to listen to how the word of God explains it so perfect. 
not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But it is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For that which I cause, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the forms of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. That a good thing which is committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in you. I love the word of God, and I love how some of it's so perfect. Now, how could it be any better scripture when it has Timothy? All right, get it? All right, you're a little slow. Save us for a holy calling, which is a life dedicated to Christ, to serve and love as the Savior has served and loved all mankind, to share the truth. That he is the only way and all those that trust upon him with their lives shall be saved. As we discussed last week, and I'm not going to go into salvation and saving and all that. But at we just real quick, what do we say from the penalty of sin, from sin having dominion over our lives and saved from the presence of sin when we are called upon and be in the presence of Jesus Christ forever. But here's where I really want to drive the point. Not according to the works, to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. The word of God makes pastors ability to preach by giving them the perfect word. I don't understand why so many pastors out there can't preach the word, but I kind of understand because they're not preaching it based on what God wants them to preach or pre preaching it based on what man wants them to preach. Sorry, friends, I love you very much, but God comes before you all. The word of God makes it clear of how we're called to preach. I don't know why this thing is driving me crazy today. Short drive. The quick definition of a false church and a true church. The false church continues to try to obtain heaven through their works, through their own ability, through their own goodness, through their religion, through all the things that will not give them the accomplishments of salvation. Amen. The true church solely probably relies on the promise of God's grace through Jesus Christ, that he has done it all upon everything for us. We cannot make it any better. We cannot make it any worse because it was perfect. It was perfect. All right. Evidently, that church which teaches this truth, the whole church and nothing but the truth is the true visible church. But as now we may manifest by appearing of Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life, immortality to a light through the gospel. Let me read this again, because if you don't understand this, and I'm not being, I'm going to be blunt. I have to be blunt out of love, out of concern, out of making sure that you know exactly where you stand with the Lord today. Okay. Who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. I'm here to tell anyone here, anyone watching, anyone reading, anyone hearing, if you don't understand that, then chances are you're not part of the true church. But before you get upset, like many do, when you start attacking different things, church, that people going to church every week is not what we're talking about. We, again, are not talking about a building, but a group that live a life in line with the word of God and have staked and their lives upon Jesus Christ as their savior, making them regenerate, making them holy, righteous in God's eyes, born again. You don't hear that much anymore. People don't preach, teach born again. What is born again? It was a big fad back in the seventies. It was part of the hippie era. No, born again means you're, you're new in Christ. The old is gone. Pretty simple. Okay. I must be crystal clear. This is for everyone that we come in contact with. Going to church does not give anyone salvation or the promise of eternal life. 
Only confessing, trusting, and believing upon the Lord with one's heart. It's not words. It's a heart, it's a heart conversion. It's a change of life. Does one obtain salvation and eternal life through him? The problem, man, and I'm going to, God is so good. I mean, I tell my wife, and a lot of times I share my message with her bits and pieces just to kind of get some a little feedback or whatever and see how it kind of strikes her. And it's a good thing if you're me, okay? Uh, the problem man has created is the fact that they believe their church or religion is far more important than knowing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Wow. We have distorted the simplicity of who Jesus Christ is. That is what religion, I'll explain to you what true religion is because people throw that back into my face. All right. We have taken something so simple that God's full of grace and mercy has provided and rather than this, he could have, you know, put it this way. If any of us were God, which we never could be, we would have destroyed man. We would have said, you know what? It's not working out. Let's clean slate again. You know, let's flood the earth, which he promised he would because of the covenant. But let's clearly start off all over. But he did it because that's how awesome and loving God is and how patient he is. But anyway, he gave us the perfect out and that was his perfect son, which was, yes, folks, the perfect sacrifice. Rather than try to understand all the Mosaic laws, some stringent religions also have, he gave us Christ. You all know the Mosaic laws. I tell you about it all the time. 613, there ain't no way we're all following them. 613, come on. The simplicity of him is one must have faith to believe in him and that God made anyone the opportunity to become part of his loving family. I don't understand why people don't want to be part of his loving family. I don't get it. You know, maybe they just think they're good enough, whatever it may be. But of course, now here's where it gets better. Once man has faith, he must continue in the ways of the Lord and word and produce fruit of the spirit to show the world he is growing in Christ. The problem, I'd like to break problems up because then it also shows us Jesus Christ is always a solution. The problem with mankind is they claim they know Christ, but there's no evidence in their life. If we claim to be a believer, then we should have evidence of continuing to grow and be more like him and less like me. Anything that is in Pastor Tim that is not of Christ is not worth anything. I'm here to tell you, but the same goes for you. All right, now let's go a little further. Man lays out religion, all the do's and don'ts, claiming this is the way to heaven the way to obedience, and one must be a member of a certain church or religion. Both I just mentioned will not lead anyone to salvation or eternal life, but it will lead the man, this, is, this breaks my heart, to a Christless eternity and complete confusion. You hear me? Confusion. Man's religion has one purpose, to cause confusion and not give one the assurance of salvation. I ask you, who's the master of deceit and confusion? Satan. Satan. Amen, my brother. Thank you. But before anyone throws in my face, wait, religion's a good thing. Yes, if you follow this. James 1.27. Pure religion. Hear me? Pure. Pure religion is undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Woo, woo. That's the only religion acceptable before God to remain unspotted. Pure at heart, walk the life of Christ and nothing else takes the man's heart or desires. So to me, that religion means that man or that woman was a believer in Jesus Christ. All right, I spoke to a nice man several weeks ago. He was just ordained by religion, a certain religion, 
And of course, we, the group, we asked them, how does one get to heaven? Now, a lot of people struggle with this and don't understand. But I figure a young man that just came out of seminary ordained to a certain church would have the answer lickety split. Okay. He says, no one knows until they get there. And I said, wow, this is not assuring at all. Not sure about you. I can only speak for myself. I don't know who, who is saved and who's not. I can tell, you know, by their walk, whatever. So, but but I, I still don't totally know. But I have assurance in Christ that my name is already in the Lamb's Book of Life, which secures my reservation. I can't talk today. Reservation for all eternity. The day I breathe my last, I know where I am going. But yet, this young man, I loved his heart, but yet he was believing and following a false religion because he could not tell anyone, how does one get to heaven? So what happens? Where am I going with this? So he now is in charge of a church. How does he lead and teach others to have the assurance of salvation if he don't have it. The term church became prominent after the apostles shared the gospel throughout all the regions, drawing people to the truth to grow amongst each other and to grow with themselves, which is in Christ. It was a gathering, listen to this. It was, a, the early church wasn't, you know, a 10,000 seat Air conditioned, beautiful windows, you know, sound system, I would knock your socks off. It was in homes. People were growing in the Lord by going from house to house to house to house. And it exploded because they loved the Lord and believed upon him. It's a beautiful thing. But we did have organized gatherings before Christ when the Israelites would gather and worship God, okay? I had to throw that in there. 1 Corinthians 10, 32 reads, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. When we hear the term church of God, that means it is the true church. It is a, when the trump blows, when the trump blows, if we are still here, we will be caught up with our Lord Jesus Christ and will not face the tribulation like many who reject it and do not know or are confused or following something that is not leading up to Christ will still be left behind. In a world, you either are a Jew or Gentile, but once the Jew or Gentile confesses in Jesus Christ, makes no difference what your nationality, who you're born into, what part of the country you were, poor, rich, good looking, ugly, it don't matter. But believing in Jesus Christ as your personal savior and they will be with the Lord. Amen. Matthew 18, 20. For we're two or three, you hear me? Two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. If Jesus is in the midst of them, then they are true believers, got me? If they are sharing the word and building each other up, so and so forth. Small gatherings in prayer and word and deed and the love for Jesus Christ. But it must be careful, this is important, we understand this. See, God just puts this out there, and it, it, I try to cover every base that the Lord puts upon my heart. I must be careful. Many people claim they never need to go to a church gathering, a body of believers, if they know Jesus Christ. Well, let's go there a little bit. One does not need to go to any building to give their life to Jesus Christ. No, it doesn't. You just got to have your heart open to the word and you confess and believe, repent, so on and so forth. And you open and allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to come upon you. Then you now, yes, friends, are part of the true church. But 
We are also called. And this puts people like to use, I don't have to go to church because I read the Bible. Oh, well, what they do, but do you know what the Bible means? Most people read and have no understanding because their heart isn't open to the Lord. So the Lord and the Holy Spirit are not going to reveal to them what he reveals to me and to you all that know the Lord. Okay. But we also call it to gather with brothers and sisters. For what purpose? To build each other up. To pray for each other. When I'm down, I need you all to pick me up. When you're down, I'll pray and pick you up. That's what it's all about. Iron sharpens iron, amen? All right. We build each other up to pray with each other, to want one another, to love each other, and to learn the word of God. Hebrews 10, 25, here it is. Not forsaken, forsaken, forsaken. The assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, I'm here to tell you, the man that sits in his recliner every Sunday and says, oh, this is my church, look at this. He's got his coffee, he's got his Twinkies, whatever he got, I really don't care. And maybe he has all reruns of Charles Stanley, says, this is my church. But yet, it says he's missing out of getting together with other believers. And it says, as you see the day approaching, does anyone see the day approaching? I do, all right? It's certainly closer today than it was yesterday, but it is coming fast. But he will come as a thief in the night, as we know. Okay. But a believer in Christ is not called to be alone. And they'll never, you're not getting, because here's what happens. When someone, all right, you know, you get again. You give your life to the Lord, and maybe you, you go like these crazy people that go in the middle of nowhere that will live by themselves. Okay, you can draw to the Lord and get strength, so on and so forth. But it's not meant to be a lonesome activity because what happens over time, the heart grows cold. And so it is the ministry of that person. We must first understand, this is the significance. We must first understand the true church is not a building or a certain denomination but it's made up of only those that are born again, regenerate believers in Jesus Christ. That is your perfect definition of a true church. First Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. This is good stuff. This, there's just so much meat we can, we can get from this. First Corinthians 12, 12 to 13 reads, for as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the, that body being many are one body so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether we have made to drink into the spirit. These believers in Christ are united in one baptism. Baptism by the presence of the Holy Spirit makes all us united. We being the body and Christ being the head makes us and makes up the true church. Praise God. Okay. This also explains the truth of baptism. A lot of people are misconceived by the truth of baptism because the religion teaches everything but the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. All right. All right. It's evident the true church knows that water baptism does not afford man salvation because it has no saving abilities. It is, and you all know this, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. People do it because they want to show their family, friends in the world, you know what? That was my past, man. I was a sinner. You know, I did this, I did that, ran here, ran there. And now I want to show them that I'm changing because I am of Christ. Many people get baptized for all the wrong reasons. They don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. It means absolutely nothing. All they did is get wet. What a bath taken at home. All right. False churches put too much emphasis on man made laws and traditions rather than placing the emphasis on who one must become in Christ. Jesus. The fact that we must first surrender on what we must be in Jesus. Knowing that our sins our sins will cast us into hell. 
That's where I was going. That's where you were all going. But when a man or woman repents of them, seeking forgiveness and allowing the Holy Spirit to come within, they change from inside out. I always tell people, not outside in, it's inside out. It's more important. Seeking forgiveness, allowing the Holy Spirit to reside in our hearts and lives. We need not worry about what the garbage man puts forth to strive for them to become the right man or woman because we have been given the promise of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 21 to 22. If whom all building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are built it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Evidently, that church which teaches the truth, you can remember this in your sleep, and I hope you do, teaches this truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is the true visible church. Build it together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We are building up together, coming together, praying, worshiping, and learning through the same presence of the Holy Spirit that God has given to those of the true church, true church. Without the Holy Spirit, in the presence of those in the building, they are not of the true church. And if you're not of the true church, it only gives you one other answer, and that is you are of the false church. The true church is and was not a 45 minute time of entertainment. It was a time spending time in prayer, in worship, learning the word, and sharing it with others outside of the church. How does the church grow? How does this church grow? We just hope. Wow, I'm going to pray that I'm going to hope that people walk through the door today. That may work. Some people have. Some of you have. You know, the Lord put a potty and go seek a church, so on and so forth. But for the most part, it's by us sharing the word and say, look, I go where they preach the word of God. Well, so do I. Are you saying, well, I'm not sure. Well, then he's not preaching the word of God. Okay. Pretty simple. And you share, you say, look, come out one Sunday. And that's how a church grows. That's how it grew back then. They were excited of who they were in Jesus Christ. All right. One visit to a place of worship does not make a Christian. Only presence of Christ in us that makes one a believer. If it's, it's a life altering process. It's not just once and done. It's an ongoing for the rest of our lives where a lot of people think once a week obligation means I'm good. Well, friends, that's religion. Sorry. A true relationship, it's not something we do as many do in the forms of religion. They do it as an act of their obligation to the church, to their membership, so on and so forth. We do it because of the love we have for Christ and the love we have for each other. That is the difference between a false church and a true church. I go by some of these churches, and I love it. Four o'clock on a Saturday. Wow, the place is packed. You know why? I'm here to tell you why. I was a four o'clock years ago before I gave my life to Christ. So I can get high and drunk later that night and not worry about getting up the next day. That's not what a true church is all about. It's about spending time with Jesus Christ and growing and learning from each other. The false church gives a brief message and does not equip anyone for the truth because they, not knowing the truth themselves, how can they lead their congregants, their members, to come to know the truth? Love this scripture. Y'all have it. John 8, 25 and 32. I put it here for a purpose. You're going to see why. And we're almost done. John 8, 25 to 32 reads, Then they said unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that has sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not when he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he. And I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he hath said, Me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I always do those things which please him. And he spoke these words, many, many believed on him. 
And then they said, Jesus, to those Jews which believed on him. Listen to this. This is where people go wrong. If we continue, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you, make you free. Hold fast the forms of sound words that thou hast heard of me in the faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. The Jews finally get it. Not all of them, but these. They finally allowed their ears to open. That's the first part. But more importantly, their heart to open. And they heard the gospel. And what did they do? They're, you know, as it says, some of the words says their hearts were pricked. They were open. They were, they were like, there's something different. You know, I, I've been following all these religious rules and mosaic laws that could not at that point lead them or give them salvation. We must understand the Jewish religion was very strong and very stringent and disciplined. And man followed it to put forth much effort in order to be obligated to it. Yet, they had nothing but following a religion that leads them to a dead end. You know, many people are on a dead end. That breaks my heart. Why a dead end? Because you can be taught so much in the form of a religion. You get a lot of head knowledge, but you get no spirit or heart knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and that one must believe upon him. The Jews seen their worship, their temple, and thought it was the truth. But once they were enlightened by the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the truth of who he was, they realized they were relying on everything but him. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set make you free. Dear beloved church, the false church leads people to everything but Christ. And there's, there's where it gets, let's just tie this up. The false church may have you leaving the building feeling good about yourself. Oh, that was such a nice, oh, he's such a nice man. He preached such a nice, I, just, I feel so good about myself. But there was no leaning to Christ or salvation or conviction for them to draw close and, and open her heart to the truth. That's what happens when false teachers are feel good. I feel, I feel good. But that's it. It don't go any further because they don't know. And so one understands the truth of what Jesus Christ has come to give them, one will struggle to be free. The false church teaches you do this, do that, and may get closer to God. And maybe you might be the chosen one that will be given the promise of heaven and salvation when you get there. It don't work that way. The true, true church tells you, John 14, 6, Jesus saith to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is my religion buster. That is my good works buster. That is my everything but Jesus Christ is the only way. Until one, until the day one gives their life to Jesus Christ, they will never be free. And I'm here to tell you that's true. Religion holds you to the religion. Please let me explain. We will, and I, I'm going to put it out there. We will never be religious enough, holy enough, good enough on our own ability and strength leading us to be chained to the law or the religion because of what we're following. But once a man gives his life to Jesus Christ, confessing, repenting, desiring, and trusting in him, they finally are set free. I'm telling you, the day I gave my life to Christ, it was like the elephant came off the chest. They tried to keep it in check. Jesus Christ is the head of the true church. We are the body. Jesus did everything for mankind. He was the perfect sacrifice. And how can any false church teaching a religion make something better than what Jesus Christ has come to give? It is impossible. I believe this is my last scripture. John 8, 3 to 11. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought, you know the story, you can sit back and listen to it. A woman taken in adultery and that they had set her in the midst. And I'm going to show you the difference between religion and Christ. They said, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what thou, what sayest thou? And they were tempting him that they might have to accuse him. 
But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote in the ground and thought he heard them not. So when he continued to ask him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, let him know this. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote in the ground. And then they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none of the, the but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Why did I put this in here? Why do you ask? According to the law or the religion the Jews followed, she would have been stoned to death and would have ended up in a Christless eternity forever. Funny, where the man, where was, can anyone ever tell me where the man was? Doesn't it take two to commit the act? But we understand these religious rulers wanted to trap and try to trick Jesus into saying something that was false. Then he hits them with their own laws. He without sin throw the first stone and they all leave. Let me make it simple. Their law would have kept them a slave to it and death would be the result. But Jesus took their penalty of their sins and ours and made us sin free because of our debt paid of all. And we can be reconciled to God the Father. The significance of knowing if we go to a true or a false church has either great reward or the most wicked, difficult consequences. If we, like the woman, continued in sin and went to the temple or the religious place every now and then, but tried to follow the church rules, she would have paid with the ultimate price of her soul perishing forever. Yet those in a true church know they would never be perfect because Christ was the only one that was complete perfect to ever walk upon the earth. But we know that him as our personal savior, our loving advocate, our go between us and God the Father. We have the assurance that when we breathe our last breath, me being a member of the true church, you being a member of the true church, we have no worries because we will be in his presence. Amen. I have one last partial paragraph and I'm gonna read it to you. And I, I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Amen. Let me be blunt. That's how it starts. Okay. Amen. Let me be blunt. How many of us would have been stoned for our sins in accordance with the law? Man, I would have been getting hit inside him with some boulders. But praise God, Christ came to call the sinners to repentance, which me, like Paul, were a chief. Thank God that all confess and believe in Jesus Christ. As your Savior, pass from death to life. Amen. Next week, we will conclude. We will finish. I will tie it all together. It's so important that we know what a true church and a church that's not teaching the truth are. Let us close in prayer, if we may. Dear loving Father, come before you. We thank you. We thank you that the word gives it to us. It's not my interpretation. It's not man's interpretation. It's the word of God. It shows us exactly what we need to do to be a member of the true church. It's nothing that I did on my own authority, on my own power, whatever. It's the power and authority of Jesus Christ that give us all the promise that for us believing, confessing, and having our hearts led to the truth and a spirit that comes upon us that leads us on the path of righteousness, we make up the true church. The true church has grown, but sadly many do not want to know or be part of it. We pray that when someone comes to not know you, Lord, and they come into our life, that we would be the strong one and share out of love, love for them, the truth of who Jesus Christ is. We love you. We thank you. We give you the glory and everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.